idea behind the album was to create an album that was not your generic um, house and techno album, I guess. I'm not saying I've invented a wheel with it, but it's kind of got a story or a concept behind it. The concept being to try and create an album that reflects, reflected the whole house and techno scene from its kind of inception to where we're at now. So when doing that, I had to take into consideration, well, where was its origins? So um, Detroit being always regarded as the home of techno, and Chicago, the, the, the home of house, and then where it developed from from that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to work with kind of key figures from those particular eras and some of the pioneers from, from those times and almost create a musical journey and I, but constantly reflecting on um, the, the scene sound. Not only was it important to work with the established artists and the pioneers from the scene, but it was also integral for the album's concept to work with up and coming producers uh, and, and the kind of new talent that's about. In doing that, um, it was important to work with the, the new breed of artists that have appeared in the label um, so far. So on the album itself, I worked with Tom Taylor, uh, Mia Wallace, Express 2, Andy Slate, uh, Eddie Folks, Ben Long, P. Ben, Marshall Jefferson and Robert Owens, Carol Cox and Steve Ward, Darren Emerson, Lenny D and Frankie Bones, Adamski, Detroit Grand Poobas, Marsh, Squire, Raymond, Lindsay and Kendall, My Evil Twin, Michael Gregg, Werner Niedermeyer. I was very much a, a kind of rock, indie type kid in the Nirvana. And at the time when I was at school, there was a lot of, in Scotland, there was a lot of raves, a rave music was going on, a lot of rave bands, and it sounded cheesy to me. So I always associated, I think, electronic or dance music as, as, as kind of cheesy synthetic music. Prodigy released Firestarter. I always remember it on top of the pops, hearing it or seeing it. And, uh, and I knew it was a Prodigy and I knew I wasn't meant to like that um, kind of song, but the energy behind it was, was pretty intense and it was similar to, you know, what maybe drew me to Smells Like Teen Spirit or something like that. It just had that kind of um, enthusiasm. The late 80s rave scene obviously has had a you know, the culturally and socially everything changed from then. The Orbital Raves, I, I was more into the clubs than uh, than doing the raves. I went to the raves, I did go. I remember seeing Cole Cox giving out flyers and stuff. And I, I, we'd done a rave wow. down in uh, Raynham called uh, Part One Warehouse oh, yeah. uh, in 87. 1887 it was, Oakenfold DJ there. And um, it, it was fantastic. It was like, you know, early, early days. And a lot of the guys that used to sort of go to Ibiza, just, it was just bubbling. And not many people knew what was going on, but there's a lot of people doing mad dances and stuff going all night going, wow, that's a bit mad. After I got into the rave scene and listened to the tapes, I would go to uh, the Resurrections in Edinburgh, travel down to Fantasias. From where I was from, up in the northeast of Scotland, like the Resurrections was like a new world to us, you know what I mean? Coming down, there was like 6,000 people going mad for it. Um, it was, yeah, at that time, it was special to me in Scotland, definitely. I was very fortunate to do the first raves ever in Scotland. And I don't mean Resurrection and those, there were parties before that. And uh, it led me in, into, into you know, the Scottish scene, which I really, really loved. I really loved. I loved the people. I loved everything about it. It was awesome. You know, it, it was different than in the than in than in, in London, but it you know the kids were up for it. They were really up for it. And as the hardcore music at that time was the beginning, it was ninety one for me. Yeah, about ninety ninety one was the time I thought. You know, and um. Wow, they really rocked the resurrection and that whole party really blew out the Scottish rave scene and Scottish hardcore, happy hardcore. So many things got to, you know, that, 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 that came from that. And then all the European DJs from other countries coming into Scotland, more so for this hardcore music than in like lower parts of England or Ireland or anywhere else. So Scotland became a very, very, very important 
for, for hard electronic music of all kinds, of happy hardcore, you know, industrial hardcore, speed core, and um, you know, whatever kind of hard sounds that you want to do. The, 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 the Scottish scene exploded too, and a lot of producers like Scott Brown, I mean, they just blew up, and you know, it, it can't be overlooked at all. I mean, Scotland had a really big part of, of the UK overall scene, and um, I'm happy to be part of all of it from, from England. I, I, I love it there, I really do. I don't really know how it all works, but it's obviously, you know, it's still having repercussions now and, you know, the, the BBC news theme is like a techno track and I think uh, there was, you know, there's always been these people that, you know, play guitar or cello or flute or whatever and say, oh, it's not really music, you know, you're just pressing a button and, and um, but it, you know, I'd, I prefer mechanical music. That spiritually, uh, I get more out of things that are very robotic and syncopated than um, jingly jangly, splishy splashy kind of um, sweaty music. Sometimes I think that the concept of the album is gone nowadays, and taking a story behind the album, I think, it, 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 it just adds maybe a little bit more weight and a little bit more value to it. And I felt no one had really done this. You know, people, don't get me wrong, people have worked with a variety of key, keynote figures. But I wanted to, to um, yeah, to do this because it, it hadn't really, to my nods, it hadn't really been done before. And it's all, almost like, a, I guess, a kind of encyclopedia to, to the sound. I was absolutely blown away by it. I thought, you know, it's a really big uh, task to, to start, um, delighted to hear all the names that are involved in it. I mean, a lot of names that I've heard growing up, a few folk I've met, a few folk I'm, you know, that are absolute heroes, and it's great to be part of it. it, really is. I'm privileged to be in with names like all the folk that are involved, and uh, it's a great album, and I was saying that to Gareth when I actually heard the album all together from start to finish. It's a brilliant listening album. You don't just, it's not like, a lot of DJs make tracks and it's just DJ tracks just to, for playing out, but that from start to finish, playing it, you know, as a as you would listen to it. Back in the day, I think listening to a tape or listening to a CD, I think that's how it should be listened to. It's, it's got its dance tracks in there, of course, but it's a very good listening experience from start to finish. He wanted something to, um, that, things that are people that inspire them uh, or um, and who he admired um, and I think it was a good concept it's, it's not a, a concept that I think you know it would be tackled by just anyone I think Gareth's got the determination to see everything through it and it, it took a long time to get the album um, to where it is I haven't necessarily wanted to create an album that, that's emulated particular sounds, you know. Um, for example, the Robert Owens, the Robert Owens and um, Marshall Jefferson track, it was there to um, obviously it's the early we're trying to create an early house type track that was used. It was very stripped down, so we used kind of modern day approaches and techniques. We went to London to mix the album and. Uh when I first heard the Adamski one, I was, it was uh, just a big wall of sound. Um, I think there was just far too much on the track to um, just to get some space in the track to make it sound good. And um, I've just actually recently heard the, the the final version of it, the, the three four beat kind of waltz thing that he's he's known for. Um, it's completely different from what I, when I left London to when I got the the masters back. My thing is I, I can only be on your album if I can do three step. You know, I, I refuse to do anything else. I, I was back in the studio last year with Seal um, and we started working on some tracks, um, three step tracks, uh, and they him and his musical director and and the other people involved wanted me to work on this other track which was in 4-4 four, four time and, and I wouldn't, I can't, I just can't do it. I've made a kind of pact with myself and God or the devil or someone, something, the universe, um, 
to only work in three step timing and then maybe I'm you know shooting myself in the foot but anyway I thought it was very you know for Gareth to say yeah cool let's do something three step I'm um, you know anybody that's open to going off on this tangent um, I respect and, and uh, I'm, I'm up for it I have to always keep it interesting for me I've been making music for several decades and, and I'm currently into only making music in waltz time in 3-4 time or 6-8 time whatever it is um, uh, it's just made it's re-energised me musically and I just I have that parameter of only working within this uh, time signature which anyway I've I, I know that the waltz um, revolution in the mid 18th century in in Vienna uh, in Austria that which then emanated across Europe and the world was the original dance underground and I love you know drawing the parallels between that and the acid house rave revolution that I was heavily involved in and that whole thing inspires me. I knew this was going to have legs because it was such a strong thing for me, you know, like in the early days, especially going out in the acid house days, that revolution was just so big, you know, it's like it just swept the nation, you know, and it was like, how can you, you that's not a fad, you know, that's, people want to go out and party with really good music um, and having a great time, you know, everyone has been doing that from the disco days, the Northern Soul days. But that one was a pretty sort of big, big smash, you know, it was a big like, explosion. Did you think then that you were breaking new ground? Because obviously what you do. Oh, of course I did. I, I'm American. <laughs> I thought there would be a House Music Hall of Fame by now and I'd be the first inductee. <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking about, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, it didn't quite work out like that, but it did. I did pretty good. I mean, I'm I'm still only doing uh, music, you know, and it's been 28 years now since I quit my job at the post office. I really thought it was going to have a, a really long shelf life, and the reason for that is I thought um, I thought white people were going to get in it and take it over, like because all all the most popular music has started out as a uh, dance music you know and and it evolves from that the problem with house music is it never evolved from the dance floor right so like that's what uh that's what what's actually held it back and and because it's and because it's gotten so formatted that's what that's what stopped it in its tracks because rock uh uh expanded it, it it evolved you know into like where you aren't even dancing to it anymore you know and like i mean from from rock around the clock it started out as dance music and everybody's like doing all this and you know and and it was great right and, and it kind of left the dance floor for a little bit when uh you know you had frankie avalon and, and those guys singing ballads and stuff but then the beatles brought it back to the dance floor and then they evolved from the dance floor and it became more like you know like thinking music and and and, and you know, then you got the hard guitars and all that stuff. And then, but you also have folk rock, you know, and uh, and country rock, and all you know, all the all this different, all this different evolution. And, and I thought that was gonna happen with house music, you know. I mean, it even though it started out as dance, you know, because well, I, that's. That's why I wanted it to leave the dance floor, uh, and uh, because I'd seen what happened with disco, and you know, disco just died, you know, because people revolted against it and stuff. But like, uh, you know, it. But uh, I really thought it was gonna last a lot longer.
we all know this, it, things go round and round, you know, and it's every now and again you get something which is new, but it's, you know, and then like, for instance, the acid housing was very new, which was completely different. That's why it was so fucking cool, you know, it was like that sound, you know, that Pierre and all that sort of created from the 303 was just like pretty sort of out there. But then if you get it, you know, it was just such a groovy little squelchy mad sound and it worked. But then it will go around again, then it will disappear for a little while, then, you know, it just goes round and round, you know, so the Detroit sounds and that are definitely coming back again, like old school Detroit sounds, you know, because these kids like don't remember those days. I'm just getting it to sound like an old man here. Maybe I am, <laughs> but it's uh, an older man. But you know, the thing is, these kids don't know the early days, but they're really digging it. You know, the Detroit thing, the techno thing as well, future music, it was about moving forward, you know, and, um, and it's definitely done that. And I think it'll carry on. I, mean, I don't think it's going to stop now. Dance music's like here. A friend of mine introduced me to the art school and the techno nights that were going on in there. And again, I didn't really know what techno was as such, other than it being a 4 4 dance beat. And initially, I didn't really, I was unsure about it, but then I kind of, um, I started to kind of pick up on that kind of sound and that's really, you know, it was nights like Test and Radar that I was going to the art school um, and then the Sound House. And it was really from there that I started to, to, to properly get into that kind of music. Um, at that time I was actually playing in bands. And, uh, and then I quickly realised that, you know, the band split up and I wanted to kind of start producing music just on my own without having to, um, ironically, uh, work with other people. And then, but then ironically, I, I do more collaborations and the electronic producers, I guess. I think techno, the roots from techno really are, I suppose, Detroit, for me, that's where it came from, you know, which is quite, um, just more energetic, sort of, the energy from it, you know. Um, I, I'd say, Detroit, but then from that, they would say it came from people like Gary Newman and Kraftwerk, and so a very European thing. It was all about the electronic thing, which was taken over and then sort of gave to us from Detroit and that. And then of course, then it went to Germany. And that's when things got tougher. You know, that's when it got a bit harder and, you know, and um, Hard House and stuff like that. And, you know, that Sven and stuff were pushing it. Oh no. And it, it, then it started getting really like up to 140 BPM, you know, pounding sort of beats. But it was great, you know, the energy from that, you know, really got you going, you know. And I love all that, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, the Chicago and Detroit music of the late 80s influenced me very much. I mean, I was really into electronic music anyway. Um, and I was into dancing in nightclubs and. I, discotheques that kind of started from two-tone when I was like 11 or something and there was the big two-tone revolution and Scar and everything was very much about dancing and moves. Um, um, the Detroit and Chicago music kind of gave it a bit of a formula uh, and those records used to, I used to listen to pirate radio in London, like LWR and stations like that, and and those tracks used to just leap out the radio at me, and um, <clears throat> those early Chicago and Detroit sounds, and uh, but they were, you know, in turn influenced by a lot of European music, like Kraftwerk and Joy Division and the British group Imagination. I used to hang out with this guy, Jimmy Polo, from Chicago in 1988 and he used to tell me a lot of the things that they were into over there and it was um, quite surprising, you know, some of it and, and I just like the way it kind of cross-pollinates across the Atlantic and around the world. Um, uh, but, it, but yeah, I'd say the music that got me a record deal in 1989 was a fusion of um, Chicago House, Detroit Techno and European Electropop really.
oh yeah, I think New York scene was very influential. Same as the Germans, the Dutch, and everybody else. Every other city, you know, we had our take on it. We definitely, the producers that came out of New York were wide, varied, you know, a lot of range of different kinds of styles and sounds. And, you know, back then it was, you know, just a few of us, if you're looking at it, like in the end of the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of musicians doing this stuff, but, you know, what transcended everything was the DJing and, you know, how to, you know, how all that kind of, you know, meshed together with the music. So, yeah, I think New York had a really big influence on, on house music and dance music in general, you know. You, you can you can cite different producers along the way and, you know, but I, I still think, you know, electronic music is a global you know, community, a global phenomenon, not just a city or a place. Um, though every city along the way has its, you know, its push to, to accelerate the music or uh, to, to make it grow. So I think, yeah, New York had a really good part of it, really, for sure. Um, co-promoter with Gareth. Uh, mm -hmm. We run the Bullet Dodge events, as they are called. We've had, Vince Watson kicked it off with a live set. And from there, we've had another live set from C Tech, Darren Emerson, mm -hmm. uh, D-Type Grand Pubas, and Marshall Jefferson, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. um, the nights are really um, focused around mm -hmm. the Bullet Dodge label itself, i.e., why we have the label parties. So basically, uh, whoever we have signed the label are the only people that would play our parties. The residency at the Limelight started um, sort of. After we were doing our things in Staten Island, believe it or not, um, some of the promoters there I had a big trip and I took every one of them to England with me and showed them what electronic music was, what I was doing every weekend, and not what we were doing in Brooklyn or Staten Island or America for that reason, which I thought was pretty sad, considering that the rest of the world was kicking it. In my own country, I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, wasn't really too happy about what was going on musically there. Um, so the residency meant a lot to me. It was how I'm gonna push all this music I'm getting worldwide. And, you know, I'm on this top DJ 100 and all this and nobody gives a shit. And I'm thinking, you know, this residency is gonna be everything. It's gonna be all the music that I think. And man, we brought so many acts into the limelight. Um, the, the scene that was created from that, wow, was amazing. So many, people got, I think, got touched by that period of time. And I don't mean with the drugs and what you see on TV and all that crap. And that existed, and just like it exists everywhere else. But um, musically, it was, a, it, was a, it was a challenge too, because, you know, the crowd was still not 100% with electronic techno music. House music, yeah, you know? Because it was coming from the disco, and, you know, I, I hate to say it, like, house music was an extension of music that, of kind of real music just made electronically. The techno music went against all that hardcore music or hard rave music whatever you say went, went against the, the you know the traditional here's my intro here's my bridge here's my hook here's I mean we had all those things but not you know saying it with songs or with these super you know live you know musicians and all that stuff and a lot of the stuff could have been out of sync out of key out of whatever but it, it, it you know it was the, the venue and having that spot in the church where 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 the where the parties were was was wow it, it meant a lot to me and to and to give the people back what i was getting musically all over the world was a bit of an honor for me a bit of a power trip too because i figured wow man i'm you know no I, I cannot fail i cannot fail because you know they're just going to get music 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 non-stop and i don't have to worry about what this guy's playing at this club or this or that and you, you know that residency brought electronic music into new york and it brought it to the kids Though it was ahead of its time, and the police and all the other things that happened afterwards kind of like destroyed the scene, uh, but the Limelight Residency was the was the beginning of it all for me in New York. Anyway, it was where it really was beyond the the, the dirty rave scene, beyond all the parties that we were doing in the park, and you know worry about getting arrested for playing music. To be honest, which is crazy now that you, you'd hear me say that, but that's what it was kind of like, and you know. And, and yeah, and I think everything that happened in that club was the real, it proved to me that America could do it. And it was it's a shame that it took more than 15 years later for it to really happen in America.
when Gareth came to me to, to put the whole idea together for the album and the concept, um, he mentioned, you know, working with these great artists, iconic artists, um, you know, that really fused the whole house and techno scene. You know, looking back at how these guys had put music together back in the day, they were using a lot of really old sequencing technology and old synths and um, old mixing consoles, old effects units. And what we wanted to try and do really was fuse a lot of the old technology um, with the new technology. Now, sort of what's new on the market at the moment is Ableton Live. That's a fantastic package that we felt that we could do the bulk of the, the production creative, process. The you know, process, you started yeah. out the, the, the whole process, the writing process mm -hmm. really in live, didn't you? Yeah, so the, I mean, the bulk of the actual album has been created on live and that's why, you know, it's a, it's a very cutting edge technology and that's what we, what we wanted to create um, and why we wanted to use that. Um, and obviously we, we mixed the album on the new desk um, and the idea was we had so much, the album in, in its entirety is, has a, obviously a, a mixture of sounds, house and techno across the spectrum and it has, there's been input from different producers so it was very important to gel that album in a particular way um, and again looking at it from um, an older piece of technology from back in the day we used the actual desk. You know. That really gave it its character because yes. we were really keen on doing as much of the production work inside the box as we could and we also knew that we were going to be bringing this album out in a live concert so what better than use Ableton Live for doing that. It gave us one platform to not only write the music, do some production even though that we were mixing outside of the box and then take everything back inside Ableton Live uh, to get it ready for the live set and at that point we were beginning to introduce some new technology based on old technology which was the new Roland TR8, we were using the TB3, you know these, these models are in the System 1 again, you know we talked to, talk to Adam and he loves his System 100 synth, you know, we, so we're using sort of modern day versions of this um, gear, mixing it with the old analog consoles, old hardware effects units, hardware compressors, but also using software to try and get this this culmination or morph of sound. And I think as well to, to utilise that desk in an electronic production as well and using something like Ableton Live hadn't really been done before or it certainly, um, and, and, you know, tying in with what the concept was. But I think as well it's very important um, it, it, the album was never, it, it, it was all, it was gelling all this together to, 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 to um, wasn't necessarily to create an actual old school sound and album, it was to gel all these different um, techniques and technologies together to create something that was unique but obviously heralded back to that, um, to where it originated from. Exactly and I think another thing that's really important about the journey that we decided to have with the old technology and the new technology is we wanted to get back into that zone where you were experiencing the, the frustrations of, of having to, to work like that because you know when you were working on an analog console with lots of hardware synths and sequencers you had to commit the mix yeah and that's what we had to you do know, and this is what we had to do so we were we were feeling we were feeling the pain let's say again yeah. Um, of, of having to make these very, very important decisions because there was no going back. There really. wasn't going, any going back at all. So if we were to go back and now remix that album, you know, it would be a different, ultimately a different sound. Ultimately you know? a different sound because you know the, every time that you're, you're turning that equipment on and heating those, yeah. those, those transistors up, it's just, you know, it's just completely different. I think I've done the album more for myself more than anything else, you know, if, it, if people pick up on the idea of what I've tried to achieve, you know, it's like success, but I mean, I think for me it's more an end game, I've, worked, I've always had this idea, this concept that I've wanted to fulfil, I think I've done that and hopefully people will um, you know, pick up on it, if they don't, you know, I'll be satisfied with what they completed for me and for the label. I think we've always tried to do that, again it, it ties in with what we've always tried to do with the label. We've never really been susceptible to, to trends etc. 
we've always tried to work with a variety of different artists from house and from techno, from you know the kind of older guy to the new guy. So I think it'll just complement what we've been doing as, as a label as well. Um, so I'm not trying. I'm not trying to, to, to educate people, no. But maybe if, if if it's if it is maybe because I guess you're looking at different markets. If, if it is you know, new fans or music lovers, whatever, that have picked up on it, then they might not have heard of some of it, or they might not have been aware of some of the scene. The scene. And I think, again, coming back to the concept of it being an original album, a remix, and obviously, you know, we're doing a documentary on it so that people actually can understand what it's all about.